Wow. Wow. This is part two. Um, go back in part one. I'm just continuing the moving water. You know what I mean? We just continuing the movement upon the water. And uh, yeah, you know, just doing some. It was so many docks that we dropped uh, in part one of this. So get that because uh, that's where we're going back, doing some recap, doing some cleanup, you know. Some stuff we had to go a little really, really, really fast. Now, you know, we're just digging through the timelines. Remember, we're digging through the 1053s as year one. You know, they're predicting this, uh, this messenger. Uh, and you got this guy, you know, this Sabatai, Zevi. He said, conversion of the purported Jewish Messiah, Zabatai, Zevi to Islam in 1666, which is a weird date, right? But this is their date of their, you know what I'm saying, apocalyptic time. I think it's the 1600s. They thought the world was ending. Columbus and then was millenarianist, however you say it. So, now... Let's get the abstract. Let's get a little bit of this. Uh, actually, chapter one, introduction and history, introduction and transliterations. So to Don May, both in history and in theology, were a most unusual group. The Don May, they began as Jews, followers of the 17th century messianic claimant messenger claimant Sabatai Zevi now when he was captured by the Ottomans by the Turks by the Ottomans and forced to convert to Islam so before to say he converted like he just made a decision like I'm gonna do this so you know I don't want to label somebody a hijack unnecessarily we don't know I don't know but this this was a messenger in the 1600s, all right, we're just talking 1666. Now he was forced to convert to Islam. I mean, you got to kind of weigh in a whole bunch of different things going on. You got the, you know, the whole Hindu untouchable thing. You know what I mean? And they're being invaded by Islam, and you got their their migration or exodus out of, you know, this India. You got these Indias here. The Indias. You got a lot to put together here. So a number of, it, of his followers did so as well. So they converted to Islam or were forced to convert. These converts and their descendants became the Don May. Clustered in Salonika. They developed a blend of Judaism and Islam outwardly completely Muslim but privately holding to many Jewish or Israelite rites and practices so they, they were forced to convert but they were still inwardly keeping their law altered somewhat to reflect their faith in Zabat Tai Zevi alright so this is like another, you know, Christos, right? Another messenger, but this is in the 1600s. In time, these converts fractured into sects. These sects became radically different from each other in both theology and practice. At first, the, this seems puzzling. After all, they all stem from the same group of converts, operated within the city and followed the same redeemer. Yet they differed on the conceptions of authority and in their belief as to what constituted the true binding authority. It was this difference in modes of authority and claims to legitimacy that shaped the divergent outcomes of the sex. These, this thesis argues that the difference in how each sect institutionalized successorship to Zabatai Zevi and modes of authority determine their eventual structure, ritual, and theology. The Don May 
provide a fascinating example of a tight-knit homogeneous group that through differences in conceptions of authorities and sources of legitimacy ended up diverging wildly in order to understand the development of the, of the dogma and the key role that their differing modes of authority and methods of legitimization played it is first necessary to give a historical overview of the movement as well as some background on Kabbalah and Jewish Messian, me, Messianism, Messianism, all right, the Messianism. Much of their unique character and theology can be tracked down to the iconic founder. Thus, it is only proper to give an introduction on both Zabatai Zevi himself and the movement he led for the historical overview. I am much indebted to the seminal work of Zabatai Zevi and his movement, Gershom Skolum, Skolums, Zabatai Zevi, the mystical messiah, except, except where otherwise stated the historical data presented here is taken from this text. So we got to get this dropped, the Zabatai Zevi, the my mystical messiah. That's what I was actually looking for when I found this. So let me know if y'all can find a drop on that. All right. So there was a lot to do with this mystical messiah in the 1600s. Now they thought the world was ending. So this is like the second coming of their Christos. And this person was saying, yes, I'm the, I'm the messiah. Now we got hindsight. Hindsight's 2020. We're like, well, what the fuck happened? Like, you know, clearly nothing happened. Right? There was no apocalypse in the 1600s. I mean, not that we know, I mean, you know, unless that was another part of the grid, some type of something, maybe something did happen, I don't know, I don't know, but yeah, man, I mean, apparently this was, you know, somebody that they took serious, the transliteration system used here represents to the best of my understanding the most current within the literature, all right, all right. So I said, while many transliterations have been used for Zabatai, Sabatai, Shabatai, Sabtai, Sevi, 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 the most current appears as Sabatai, Zevi. Thus, this will be used throughout. Similarly, each domain group presented have been known to by many names. I will use the transliterations Yukubi, Yakubi, Yakub. I mean, right there, <laughs> you run right into it. So, are these hijacked converts something else? Or is this a major piece or a major key going down of what they're thinking the world is ending at that time? And this messenger that apparently, you know what I'm saying, had these Israelites that were forced to convert to Islam, but they still kept their laws. Now they went by the name Don Me, Don Me, or Yakubi, Yakuba, Yakub, Yakubi, Yaku, Jacob, Karakas, Kapanski, Kapansi, Kapansi. Since these appear to be the most faithful transliterations in standard English type. So here's a timeline, 1626, Zabatai Zevi, born in Smyrna. All right, we got to get some of the Smyrna. That's 1626, they say, all right. 1648, Zabatai Zevi has his first revelation of messiahship and starts committing strange deeds. Sounds like Jesus. I mean, what was the foundational legend of this Messiah that they're calling Jesus? We have all kinds of these correlations. We have, our, you know, the Moshe, Meshi. We got this guy apparently doing some, some amazing things. Now, he dies in 76, so he was 50 years old. All right. 1651, Zebatai Zevi is expelled from Smyrna, begins his travels, 
and is expelled. 1665, Nathan of Gaza pronounces Zebatai Zivi Messiah. So he's pronounced as the Messiah. Zebatai Zevi is arrested and converts to Islam in 1666. So the next year, after he's pronounced the next year, when they think the world is ending, he converts to Islam when they think the world is ending. And he dies 10 years later. Let's get a little bit more. In order to fully understand the Zabatian movement and later Don May's development, it is necessary to discuss Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, given that much of Zebatai Zevi's own thoughts and theology originate in Kabbalistic ideas. Zebatai Zevi began, began as a student and scholar of Kabbalah, and its influence on him throughout his life was pervasive. However, Kabbalah, as with the mystical segments of all religions, is a varied and evolving body of ideas. As such, some introduction may be required. Kabbalah did not originally concern itself much with Messianism. It drew from old Gnostic traditions and philosophical ideas and focused more on the individual Kabbalistic cleaving to God and mystical union then on the redemption of israel as a whole so it wasn't focused on the re redemption of israel as a whole let you know that it was a hijack the zohar the seminal the seminal text of the kabbalah written in spain before the expulsion began to change this it concerns itself greatly with the advent of the messianic era and says the true insight and, and the true insight and wisdom is impossible until the Redeemer comes to free all Jews from exile. So this uh, Zohar we actually have up in the uh, Drop Library. If I still have the link up here. Yeah. Uh, well, you dig on You got the link below. But uh, yeah, you got the Zohar up. There's a couple of different versions of it. So, you know, it's saying that uh, you know, it's bringing in this messianic situation of a redeemer free Israel from exile. In the 16th century, Safed in the month in the north of what is now Israel, what is now Israel, became a major center of Kabbalistic thoughts. They developed a system of mythological ideas designed to make deep truths more understandable, which became popular with the laity and resulted in an upsurge of interest in mysticism by the common Jews. The greatest of the Sabbath Kabbalists was Isaac Luria Ashkenazi. Yeah. yeah, we talking. Now we're connecting things. The greatest of Safed Kabbalists was Isaac Larea Ashkenazi, who described an elaborate theology of exile and redemption and redemption, Esha, eschatology. Eschatology was crucial. To his system of thought, Lorraine's views were and still are enormously influential, and it was in a Melu that was deeply interested in such ideas that Sabatai Zevi began his career. Alright, you're getting to this little Zapan Zevi. Alright, so let's keep going. Let's keep going. You got the link. But we got to keep digging on this Zepan Zevi. Now, how are we going to tie this in? Get back to the uh, medieval empire of the Israelites. Love to my sister, Miss D, man, for just putting this on a, on a great radar at the right time. I'll praise the creator. I'll praise our creator. Wah. Hey, hi, how We all feel it. We all feel it. So we're in chapter 14 with belly flopping. Let's go. Common features of the empire. Let's see how this is connecting. I'll bring in your chronology. We're back in the in the teachings of Fermenko. Where he's breaking down. How you've been dropped off. The duplicates. You've been put all over the place. Scattered. 
dropped off 3,000, 300, 1,000 or 1,100, damn near, 1,800. So you got these huge gaps in times that are the same people, the same empire. And it's being spread out like, like jam. Mushed around so that you don't get the picture of what actually happened to you and what true your your story looks like. You don't even care, right? You're like, yeah, whatever, slavery. Yeah, 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 yeah. I might be spending. Who cares? Oh man, spending don't pay my bills. So. <laughs> and these are the things that again, you know, you put a man, you put a frog in a. In a habitat, the first thing you're gonna do is search out his habitat. You, know, you put a fish in, in water, it's gonna search out his habitat. The minute you stop searching out your habitat, the minute you stop caring about your freedom, your actual true freedom, habitat, your land, your rights, your birthright, the minute you stop caring about that which is born to you, born for you, created for you. Designed for you, sealed for you. This has been preserved for you. It is your inheritance. You always care about your inheritance. You always care about your heritage and your orientation. That's just common sense. That's being awake. To care if you're spending or not is awake. <laughs> Don't you care if you're spending or not? These are questions that we're digging through a bunch of opinions and so-called facts, but we're extracting the drop. So go to chapter 14, let go. The vast majority of works which have been created by traditional historians contain, as we see, distortions and insurmountable contradictions, just what is one to believe in our opinion only the facts, that is, this is of course uncommonly difficult because they are quite often replicated widely and spread by the adherents of the Scaliger chronology. Right? Scaliger is a big player in this fake grid chronology business the fake times and laws Gallagher is all over it. into different epics and histories and centuries by those who created chimerical chimerical antiquity in the 16th to 19th century all right so these 1600s 1500s man they did a sorcery on us Here's a short list of doubles from antiquity in the Middle Ages, Vladimir Ivanov. So we're going to look at the duplicates. We're going to look at the phantoms. That these things are occurring in multiple places and how they are possibly much more recent. Right? Virgil. Virgil, Pilador, Polydor, the much wise of the 15th, 16th centuries. Levi, 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 Tito, Levio, De Forlo of the 15th century. Hieronymus, Hieronymus of Rotterdam of the 15th to 16th century. Augustine, Lorenzo Valla of the 15th century. Vitravius, Leo, Leon, Batista, Alberto of the 15th century. So, these are people that are, you know, popping up in different places, you know, thousands of years apart, or over a thousand years apart. You got Shakespeare, a number of authors in the 16th, 17th century. Ptolemy, a number of authors in the 15th, 16th century. All of them, Archimede, Archimedes, Aristarchus of Samos. Man, so you got Shakespeare... You got Jesus Christ, a number of figures in the 15th to 17th centuries. Wait, because we just have another substantiating source. We just all praise the Creator, have another source that we just got. 
breaking down. Sabbatai Zevi in 1600s. And now we're getting from another source. That there's multiple JCs in the 15th, 16th, 17th century. Let's go. And nevertheless, we attempt to determine just what it was in reality in the times which played a decisive role in the formation and development of modern civilization from time to time. We have to repeat in a few words what already has been said in many positions will be confirmed only in subsequent chapters, but these deficiencies, deficiencies are unavoidable. Since it is impossible to talk about all of them at once, let us recall that we do not have precise reference points and geographic titles and names and even worse in the dating of events which occurred before the 18th century. We do not have precise reference points, geographic titles and names in the dating of events which occurred before the 18th century. They can't figure it out. They just give you the illusion that they can. They just give you the illusion that there's outer space when it's all within the barrier. Some researchers think that this is the result of some kind of worldwide conspiracy, hmm. Confederacy, hmm. Which is directed at distorting the history of one country or another, minimizing its importance, marginalizing them in the saga of mankind and concealing facts which are extremely disagreeable for someone. Huh. It is wrong to go to such extremes in our opinion. Everything that we have in the traditional history today is a result of a gradual layering of errors and distortions via an adjustment of past events under a knowingly incorrect model which was, di which was dictated by momentary political interests, a practice which has been spread broadly even in our days. Now, I'm pretty sure it's been a result of some kind of worldwide conspiracy which is directed at distorting the history of one country or another the so-called negro minimalizing and marginalizing the so-called negro's importance in the saga of man kind of man kind of man mankind jewish not quite man but mankind not quite Jerusalem, not quite Hawa, but kind of, and concealing facts which are extremely disagreeable for someone. The incorrect chronological model contrived by numerologists and astrologers in the 16th century played a decisive role, as we have already noted. The erroneous interpretation of a whole series of fundamental ideas such as the start of a new era after the birth of Christ and also key words in the definition of temporal intervals made their own contribution to the distortion of history. For example, the basic meaning of the Latin word saculum, saculum, generation. Meanwhile, it's, it often is treated and translated as century. So I might say centuries, but they're talking generations. But if in one text is written seven centuries ago and another seven generations, then the difference is at a minimum 500 years. At a minimum. So it could be damn near a thousand years. You could have added a thousand years like that such as the trustworthiness of many key words. The situation with geography is even more confused. A medieval author, when referring to Rome, Troy, Egypt, Palestine, or Galilee, was able, depending on his education and local tradition, to name many different places, and in the majority of cases, these are not those places and cities which bear these names today. The mention by an old French author of the burning of Troy had a meaning for him different from that which a later author in England 
had in mind a spiritual verse of the people of God sect which was formed in Russia in 1645 runs All right. this is a spiritual verse of the people of God which was formed in Russia Rus in 1645 along the blue Kokvalinsk and worldly sea they sailed the guest appeared the ship's captain from distant cities of Israelite tribes wow I mean sometimes just the evidence just starts mounting up sometimes the books become unsealed a history of Russian literature I mean why would you look for that book Unless it starts breaking down Israelite drop. A spiritual verse. This is a spiritual verse of the people of Hawa. Formed in Russia 1645 people. Along the blue. I don't really want to get what this is. The Kavalinsky or Kavalinsk. And worldly sea, they sailed. The guest, they sailed. The guest appeared. The ship's captains from different, from distant cities of Israelite tribes. The guest sailed to Jerusalem town to stone Moscow. Jerusalem town to stone Moscow. And here's another comparison, which I heard before, of this Moscow and Jerusalem. And how this original Kremlin is in connection with an Israelite kingdom. As recent as 1645. Come on, my people, we're waking up out of a recent slumber. Moscow, it turns out, was Jerusalem for them. And the Slavs, the tribes of Israel. So sometimes you see Slavs, and it's referring to these slaves that they're calling slaves or Slavic because of the bondage. You were in so much bondage that you were just called Slavs. That's how much bondage you had to get through, go through. Are we talking Persia? Are we talking Medes? Are we talking Babylon? Are talking Assyria? Are we talking Roman? Are we talking Greece? Are we talking American corporation? Papal bull? How many? How long does it take to choose up? Moscow, it turns out, was Jerusalem for them. And the Slavs, the tribes of Israel, the disappearance of the names by which our ancestors called them and the steady procession of nicknames like Great Tsar and Warrior Tsar add to the difficulty. So you see Tsar, you're like, that must be a hijack. Khazar, but then you re research the Khazar, Tsar, Caesar, Caesar, Khazar. Which is coming out of Kazaria, which was before that. Mazaka, which was before that. Mosak, which is the beginning. Mosak, Moses, the founder. And you see, I have a foundational legend in Turkey. Connecting to the Byzantine. <laughs> connecting to the Rus, Russia, and the Moscow. Moses is Moscow. Whoa. Moses is Mazaka, Turkey. Whoa. Mosak. Is Mashika, Meshi, Mexico? Whoa. And in Josephus, he says, so was the entire nation once called. Malavius. I got some Josephus job. And I keep. Going back to this riddle, because I, I can't get, I've never been able to escape or get this riddle, you know, away from me, man. It's always been nearby in chapter six, man. 
the antiquities of the Jews, Josephus, man. It's always a fingertip away. We just talking Mosak. And you know, he just goes off, he's just rambling about about now as Javon and Madai, the sons of Japheth, from Madai came the Medians, who were the Medes by the Greeks, Javon, Jonia, and all the Grecians are derived. Thobel founded the Thobelites, which are now called the Iberes. And then he comes in Mo Mosak Mosakeni, Mosasheni. I mean, who's this? Who's this? <laughs> is this is this JPEG? Nah, he's just putting it in here. Now look how he does it. And the Mosashini, Mosakini, Mosashini were founded by Mosak. Who is Mosak? He doesn't tell you who Mosak is. He's just putting it in here. But he gives you a hint. Now they are the Cappadocians. <laughs> Getting excited, man. Cappadocians. Then it became Cappadocia. Then it became Khazar, Khazaria. But you researched the Black Khazars. <laughs> Black Caesar. Right. There is also a mark on their ancient denomination. What does it mean? We're just talking Mosak. Now, he done named Javon, Jonia, Medes, Medians. He didn't go into all this. He didn't go into all this. Not until he pulled Mosasini, Mosakini out of a rabbit hat. A, hat, a rat out of a rabbit out of a hat. <laughs> Boom. Comes Mosakini, founded by Mosak. We researched Mosak, the founder. You're just talking about the foundational legend of Moses. Then called Cappadocia. And there is a mark. Now a mark is a sign. A mark is a sign. X marks the spot. So now you have this X, this cross coming up, but you're just relating it to Christianity, not the four cardinal points. Not the crossing of energy, the ley lines, the crossing. You're just talking two lines. So we're brainwashed to see cross Christian. <laughs> cross has an indigenous meaning for way be before the imaginations of a Christus or Jesus. There was the crossing of energy. Now there is also a mark, a cross, a sign. Of their ancient denomination. Still to be showed. So he's saying this is prophetic. It hasn't happened yet. Something is a something is a sign to do with this tribe of Moses. With this Mosak. With this Meshi. With this Mozaka. With this Byzantine. With this Israel. With this Mark. Of their ancient denomination still to be showed. It hasn't happened yet then. For there is even now among them a city called Mazaka. Mashika. Which may inform those that are able to understand. What is he talking about? What is Josephus talking about? Honestly, he didn't go into all this about anything or anybody. Read it up and down, up and down. But he goes in. He goes in, man. On Mosak. How do we skip this? How do we not look into it? Because he said, even now among them, a city called Mazaka. We're talking Bezatine. Which may... Now inform those that are able to understand. Is that a riddle or what? May inform those that are able to understand. That so was the entire nation once called. Now what entire nation? You know he's not just talking about the city. He founded Mosak, founded Mo, Mo, the Mosak, and were founded by Mosak. You know, he said the entire nation. I mean, 
What does that encompass? What did it encompass to Flavius? What did the entire nation encompass to Flavius? And why is Moscow named after Moses? Mosak. Moscow, Mosak. Get it? Maz, 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 Maz. Get it? Mazaka. Mo Moses, Moshi. Meshi, Meshika, Meshika, Meshiko. They're hiding Moses in the foundational legend of Mosak, the founder. A sign on their ancient denomination, a mark, a cross. Still to be showed. Still to be revealed. A messi a messianic messiah. Mashika, Messiah, Meshi. That something prophetic will happen through this sign, with this sign, to be shown. For there is even now among them a city called Mazaka. Then they changed it to Kazaria. Now you order a Kazar salad, a Caesar salad, a Kazar salad. But it was originally Mazaka. And originally before that, Mosak. Founded by Mosak. Which may inform those that are able to understand. That so was the entire nation once called. Let's go back. In order to reestablish a correct sequence of events in the correct chronology, one must define priorities in the research and scale of historical sources. One must acknowledge that the most reliable basis in the building of a, cr of a chronology lies in the strict methods of mathematical modeling, astronomical calculation, since the probability of forgery in the, dr in the drawing, for example, of a zodiac is very small. And a totally for manco. And his followers have demonstrated this most strikingly among the written sources. Those are more important in which there are no descriptions of political events. These descriptions, unfortunately, always are ten tendentious, tendentious trust in various codes, laws, notes, receipts, and in general, any documentation not intended for hairs is much greater. Relying on them, we can say with confidence that European civilization is the oldest and therefore most developed in the history of mankind. <laughs> really? Relying on them? Oh, he's saying, oh, relying on their documentation. It was a long time coming to its quantitative leap, which occurred by 800 to 900 of the new era. If one is to use the terminology of traditional history, the leap was conditioned by the massive transition to settling down and farming initially in the Mediterranean region, which is the one most favorable for human habitation. So it was a long time coming to its quantitative leap, which occurred by 800 to 900 of the new era. Some quantitative leap. And we're just, you know, going through the Tinoch Titmans. We're going through that up until this 16th century, 15th century stuff. We're making quantum leaps in traditional history. Written sources almost do not exist from the subsequent two centuries since written language had only just originated in the form of hieroglyphs. Only the analysis of such an objective and reliable a process as the development of technologies can render reliable and direct aid in the study of this period. It shows that on the threshold of the second millennium, the smelting of iron was discovered. The mining of ore and coal began and the horse appeared 
on a list of, of domestic animals. It was nearly impossible to be involved with meta, metal, metallurgy, metallurgy in a nomadic way of life, and it wasn't even necessary for the nomads. Only the needs of the economy were able to force people to search for more effective materials for the creation of implements and a more powerful drafting force for work in the fields. These discoveries determined the rapid development of the regions with an abundance of iron ore deposits and coal for cooking, especially in Central Europe. A network of petty agricultural principalities and small city-states covered the Europe and Asia of all of that time. The linguistic and religious diversity in the conditions of such fragmentation undoubtedly was enormous, even though fertility sun cults predominated there. They worshipped the gods of the sun, wind, sky, and rain. In a word, anything that influenced crop capacity, there were no discussions of evangel evangelical Christianity, Judaism, Islam, or Buddhism. Their time still had not arrived. It was still necessary to grow into their use of abstract ideas of high complexity, like the omnipresent and unseen God. All right, let's go. By the 11th century, the development of the economy had reached a level where it became possible to allot part of the accumulated social product for the maintenance of regular troops. The early stages of a professional army had appeared. So we're saying appeared where? Appeared for them? This is the early stages of a professional army appearing for them? Now we have these crusades happening in the 11th century, alright? This is the same time, you know, surfing the wave of these particular docs, these manuscripts, that their JC, their Messiah is born, 1053, according to the astronomical events happening with the eclipse and all that, the, the, the birth of a star, you know, all that, so... They put it together, so now you have this birth of this Messiah. Then you have another Messiah, but in 1666. <laughs> it's about the 11th century, and then they have a developed economy, enough to have, you know, a lot of part for uh, these uh, ma maintenance of uh, regular troops, the early stages of the professional army. So now they got a, the early stages of the professional army. And now they got the Crusades popping up. All right. It is important to emphasize this for the following reason. In all ancient writing and also in the historical works which are devoted to ancient troops, it tells about armies of hundreds of thousands of thousand warriors who are armed and the last word and the last word of the military equipment of that day. For example, ancient Persia is named which equipped a 200,000 man army for campaigns even the Bible didn't avoid giant mania. <laughs> giant mania, the result of a census of the Israelites, participants of Moses' military campaign, are cited in the book. They amounted to 635,550 men of draft age. That's a massive campaign, man. These are assertions which have nothing in common with reality. A theory developed by the most prominent military leaders and military theoreticians of the world shows that no country, either past or present, can sustain an army in which more than 5% of the male population is involved. 10% is already an economic and military catastrophe. A state is unable to maintain an army of this size, supplying it with all its necessities and replenishing it as, as necessary during military operations with fresh and full-fledged replacements without interruption. A professional army and only professionals can wage war successfully appeared only when society was able to allocate part of its accumulated total product for it. That is, in the Middle Ages. Here we go. The whole northern Mediterranean region there and then immediately began to simmer militarily. The southern regions, although richer, began to lack behind in ornaments from lack of iron deposits, coal, and metal, metal, metallurgical technologies. In the further south, 
the greater the discrepancies in 50 or in 1150 to 1200, a decisive leap ensued. This was the invention of the iron horseshoe, without which the use of horses is not possible at all, led to the appearance of military cavalry crusades, which had an incontestable advantage over infantry. The military expansion of the technological advanced northwest against the richer southern regions developed into a war of a global scale. This was the first world war in the history of mankind. We're just getting some drop. Accounts of its early stages and of the process of the empire's creation and the historical chronicles are obscure and confused with descriptions of subsequent wars and the period, period of its collapse. For this reason, determining what happened would be a pursuit of many decades. However, let us try to formulate what is already clear today. We assume that the initial expansion, we shall call it conditionally the First Crusade of Alexander the Great, began from the territory of the Balkans and enveloped most of the inhabited land in southern Europe in southern Asia, all the way to Kashmir in India and to North Africa, including Ethiopia. Once begun, the expansion, i.e., the empire's enlargement, continued without interruption through its own momentum. There is not in history of mankind an empire which did not strive for the steady expansion of its borders and spheres of influence. The empire's Victorious professional army reached a point at which it dictated to the center rather than being governed by it. And it needed a permanent war. Otherwise, there would be no more plunder, promotions, or glory to propel victorious commanders into prominence. Worse yet, professional warriors do not possess any skills except military ones in peacetime. They are not only all but useless, but potentially dangerous as well. After the wars of the 20th century, the demobilized conscripts became, came to be known as the lost generations. In the final analysis, a permanent war leads to a catastrophic exhaustion of material and human resources, thus weakening the center of the empire. So it was with the first, first empire. All the way down to the events of the Fourth Crusade, which was the start of its collapse. The campaigns were not call crusades by accident. Any military operation requires a spiritual underpinning, a shared conviction of the rightfulness of the assault. Troops need to be inspired by the justice of war, otherwise they will shirk or fight without enthusiasm, and this augurs defeat. The ideal basis of the initial expansion was reflected in the religious chronicles as the right of the people of Israel to the Holy Land, which was given to them by God. It is noteworthy that Moses' troops, who were making the campaign, were divided into 12 tribes of troops, which received as their reward after the victory 12 vast territories with their cities and fields in America. The secular chronicles describe the conquest as the first crusade for possession of the Holy Land and its purification from the unbelievers. The empire's territory also is divided into 12 thema. Such a definition of crusade does not resonate in the least with the Christian conception of a just war and the modern understanding of the word. We shall allow ourselves here to recall again that the Christian cross appeared long before Jesus Christ as a symbol of the Son, and that Jesus Christ in the Quartari, i.e. pagan, understanding means Messiah of the world, or light of the world. So yeah, it can mean, what we get, we shall out uh, Jesus Christ as the symbol of the Son at the Christian cross. I mean, that's one comprehension, you know, <laughs> So, you could take that. You could take crossing. You can take, um, you know, what I'm saying these the these patterns is this crossing, this design, these this grid. You know, what I'm saying what's being put there. What what energies? You know, what I'm saying are going in these cardinal areas and these cardinal points. You 
can say, oh, okay, these two things cross. That must be the sun. We understand that, you know, these symbols are flipped. So it might, one symbol would represent, you know, a multitude of things depending on how it's being perceived and how it's being taught and the energy that, you know what I'm saying, is being put on it in these crystals, you know what I'm saying? Whatever the intention is that's being put on a symbol and then taught. And that's the progression of this brainwash that we have to now symbols and symbols all over the place. Every commercial you see, symbol, symbol, symbol. Now those symbols, and they they might have an indigenous, you know what I'm saying, drop, but the intention that's being put on it in that particular design of that symbol, how it's being presented, you know, could be, you know, or is the hijack energy, the hijack frequency that's being, you know, pulled from the stuff. It's the intention that was put on that symbol. What was it intended? If it was intended to hijack you, and that's their intention. It's being put in that presentation of it. It's being presented in that symbolic presentation of it. But then your ancestors will have a presentation that has another reflection, has another uh, intention. You know what I'm saying? So we were told to you know not have no graven images, to stay away from all. You know what I'm saying? Anything that could possibly hijack us. So once we start using these things, you know, those energies, you know, we become real hijackable. Once we start relying on these symbols, once we start relying, you know what I'm saying, on, um, you know, anything that represents our creator or represents something, you know, rather than just feeling it, just being it, just vibrating to it. Uh, I truly believe, just like the uh, you know job about the Thoth, that the you know, when Thoth introduced writings, he's introducing symbols, and these symbols, you know, they have their traps, their snares. You know what I'm saying? If you don't know these symbols, you're speaking English and you're doing spells and spelling. You have lots of traps and spells and and snares in the grammar grammar school. So the same thing with these symbols. I mean, you got the symbol, the Hebrew. Uh, the Hebrew letter Tau, right? The Tau, and then that's the cross. So, what's the indigenous drop? You know what I'm saying? Behind this Tau, behind this cross. Just in case somebody got to see it, man. Sometimes you got to see things. got to see things sometimes. Tau, Tau, Tau. Yeah, I just want to make sure we're correct. All right, Tau, T-A-W. What is this? It is a cross. All right, in the in the uh, picto. Then you got the paleo, which turned the cross like that, but it was still a cross. So you have this on some of the shields. We see the shields. You know what I'm saying? The royal families, the shields. It's still a cross. It's still a cross. It's a towel. It's crossed sticks. Mark. Sign. Signal. Monument. Whoa, wait. It's a mark. What did Josephus just tell us about Moshi? Moshinini? <laughs> Mosakini? Mosa? He says there is also a mark of their ancient denomination still to be showed. Now we see an indigenous drop. Now he just said, oh, the cross represents the sun. And you say, yeah, but that's also one of my Hebrew letters. The cross, the tau, the cross sticks, mark. It's a mark. So when Josephus is saying mark, there is also a mark. There is also a cross, a crossing, a Moses, a Moshini. A mozart babies in the bath water man which may inform those that are able to understand that so was the entire nation once called a mark a cross a crossing a moses a mozart let's keep going don't you love why don't you love existence? We're talking about a mark, a messiah. They're giving you a cross, Christ, hijack to take the frequency 
from the messenger or the message that's always been here for you. We postulate that when the empire was formed, four main power blocks contested for supremacy from the west, the Latin from the north, the Slavic, Gothic from the east, the Semitic from the south, the Ethiopian. Interesting, the War of Latins with the Slavic Goths in Egyptian text called the Keta, okay? Was long, was a long one which ended with peace. The Slavic Gothic influence was immense. Evidence of it is found over a huge territory all the way to India, where Sanskrit is indistinguishable from Proto-Slavic. And one of the tribes there has even preserved the ancient name Aryans, Aryans, which means noble, righteous. The progeny of the largest branch of Gnosticism. The initial conquest in many ways displays an economic character. The less wealthy Northwest went to war against the Southeast for the sake of conquest of the fertile land there. As the Old Testament maintains by the lips of the Lord, it is said, I have come down to deliver them, the people of Israel. Yes, so-called Negro, it is about you out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land, out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. What does it mean? Thus the first crusade was a Volks, Volkswanderung, Volkswanderung. Women, old men and children rode in carts behind the army in order to settle the conquered places once and for all with families, kins, and clans, tribes. In the history of mankind, such a, con such a campaign has been repeated only once. This was the settlement of America. <laughs> Where the newcomers cleared a place under the sun for themselves with fire and sword. They maintain that these lands were promised to them by God. <laughs> From the point of view of the people of the 21st century, their claims seem doubtful. All of us today are convinced that the right to possess one or another territory is born out of the long-standing residence of that or the other people on it. But it wasn't always so. All the way up to the 19th, 19th century, there were conquering territories they were conquering territories which was considered a weighty argument in the disputes about to whom they belong if i want it that means it is mine if i took your wallet does it mean it's my wallet and if i pass that wallet down five seven generations in my family and they all know that wallet they're like yeah that's drops wallet that's my great 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 granddad but yet i took it from your granddad does it still make it my wallet? Because seven generations later, they still think it's my wallet. And, and they're calling themselves Americans. I mean, I'm just saying. It's still the wallet of the person who was jacked. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Seven generations later doesn't change the fact that it wasn't my wallet if I stole it, right? Time don't heal <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The atrocity. Right? Variations of such assertions were afterwards repeated more than once in the aggressive wars of the most diverse empires. They resound in all might, as we see even in the Bible. One would like to emphasize that practically in all the chronicles, they were spread both geographically and on the scale of time. Two great political figures are reflected. Let us call them conditionally conqueror and reformer. All of these figures are merged in some variants. The personality of conqueror has been duplicated many times. Here is an incomplete list of his reflections. The ancient Egyptian Ramses II, Alexander the Great, 
Diocletian, Diocletian, Justinian, Charlemagne, oh, they want to call Joshua Conqueror. <laughs> Details of this unusual biography are repeated in a number of descriptions of other figures on the past in the ancient Egyptian writings. The Conqueror's biography, a pair of figures often exists. Father and son, for example, a pair of Macedon Macedonians and a pair of Ramses. It is possible that there really were two of them. Questions immediately arise. Why are they multiplied on the pages of the Chronicles and why are they called different names? We shall recall again that all names cited above are not in the least names but nicknames. We now proceed, let us assume. The word Charlemagne as the name of a concrete ruler. But as a matter of fact, it only means great king. Wow. They were able to call any ruler a great king. And if we then identify one particular individual as Charlemagne, then this is only on the strength of historic tradition. No one knows how his parents really named him. And apparently one will never know because it was not the custom of those times to give a man the same name from birth to death so he had different names as customs in which connection these nicknames in and of themselves also sound differently in different languages and here appears one place let us assume King Chlorus and in another the Pale and not every reader by far understands that this is one and the same man because Chlorus is also the pale in another language. Therefore, we also have designated the first emperors of the first em empire in the world by the words conqueror and reformer. As regards the doubling of their figures in different chronicles, this happened as early as after the collapse of the empire when the chroniclers and analysts of the newly formed states wrote a supposedly ancient and glorious genealogy of the new sovereigns. The history of an empire which had gone out of existence served them as an abundant source of raw materials full of interesting events. It was possible to draw facts out of this and to embellish these as much as fantasy or expedience required. We have seen this in the writings both about ancient Greece and about ancient Rome and about even older ancient China. It was extremely easy and simple to do and as much as we have been emphasizing constantly, there were very few educated people counted in society. And one more reason for the doubling conqueror and reformer as to all people on earth possess both positive and negative qualities. Moreover, their actions, which were recognized as fine ones in one epic, were considered reprehensible in another epic. So they're like flipping the story. Flip it like this, flip it like that. This is amazing, man. And here it suited the chronicler to separate the bad, in their opinion, deeds from the good. And since in a number of cases the bad deeds had to be put somewhere, the great figure, as a rule, gave rise to a malefigure, figure, a double. So it's the same person. You're like, how does this person add up to this person? And it's the same person, but... <laughs> A malefactor. They doubled it. They doubled and put the bad deeds over here and the good deeds over here. Man. Whom the chroniclers sent into distant antiquity. So they said, let's send that bad guy way back here. <laughs> Often with the very same name. The good doubles had one common feature. They were imbued from infancy with genuine Christianity and devoted their whole life to its triumph and among them without fail were the ancestors of them who ruled the countries during the creation of the chronicles and the chroniclers fallingly devoted their works to them the magnificent magnificent the sun like the purple clad and so on and so on and so on by authors rightly concerned about their daily bread in reality life was full as it is even now both of meaning meanness and holiness only little by little in conqueror's epic a single religion still had not been formed at the empire's ideal 
ideological basis, there was the uninterrupted annexation of ever newer and newer lands. And in the same, in the state, a mixture of languages and, ri and rivalry of cultic paradigms prevailed. Everyone drew from the local pagan cults whatever was expedient for the glory of conquering. This, in particular, found its reflection in the legend that Alexander the Great, having conquered Egypt, took from the hands of the local priest the symbols and title of the pharaoh, thus becoming the earthly embodiment of the sun god, that is, he became a living god. In the east they called the conqueror the father of the Khans. Khan father. Another, uh, you know, epic says that, uh, you know, Genghis Khan called Preston John Khan father. Or Batu Khan, Khan Batu in the western variant, Vatican in the gothic variant, Attila. Alright, so you got these Khans over here, Vatican over here, Father the Khans over here. Uh, Attila over here, the word Pope became a key for understanding all subsequent political processes. They named Conqueror's Capital the Eternal City. Alright, so they named Conqueror's Capital the Eternal City, or the City of All the World, or the City of God's Deputy. Such is the sense of the names in particular and in different languages, Jerusalem, Rome. Sargrad, a century later, they named it Constantinople. The Roman Catholic Church will do this in the 15th century after finally being separated from the Byzantium. Now they become the good guys, and those are the bad guys. But Byzantium was just brought down. After the collapse of the Byzantine Empire in 1453, the era continued to be used by Russia, Rus, which witnessed millennialist, millennialist, they thought the world was ending in 1666. Movements in Moscow, Moses, Mashi, Moshe, Moscow, in 1492. So the collapse of the Byzantine in 1453, a year after the Papal Bull said subjugate all these Negroes everywhere. The era continued to be used by Russia, which witnessed millennial, millennialist movements in Moscow in 14, 1492. Now Columbus comes looking for you. <laughs> Put it together. I mean, we're just talking Josephus and those that are able to understand that so is the entire nation what's called Mozaka, Mosak. Mashika, Mashka, Mashika, Mashiko. We're talking Byzantine, Mazaka. Now, where's the duplicates? What's the trio? Because if they did all this, you know they're hiding something. I mean, look at all this effort. You can't say there's nothing there. Right? So what's the foundational legend? That's all we're talking about with the drop. We're extracting, we're doing alchemy on this thing. We're putting pressure on the substance, getting a pure substance. We're talking Byzantine. And it will proclaim, proclaim Rome as its new capital. All right, so we went from Byzantine to Rome, the eternal city. The renaming operation was carried out for the justification of the instrument of Constantine's denotion. Donation. According to it, the papacy supposedly inherited imperial authority from Byzantium, but when long, but when before long in that same country, Lorenzo Valla showed the spuriousness of Constantine's donation, Catholic Rome began to explain the name of the former Sarigrad as derived from the Greek name Constantine. 
In other words, there was a great emperor, emperor with such a name, and the city was named in his honor. And today we perceive the name of the eternal city exactly like that. But the whole secret is that the word Constantine itself signifies Latin permanen, that is eternal. So you're just talking about this eternal situation and it's named after someone. And Josephus just said, so was the entire nation once called. There was a mark of ancient denominations founded by Mosak. We're talking to Byzantine. There was a great emperor with such a name, and the city was named in honor, in his honor. What are we saying, all right? Italian Rome was founded only at the end of the 14th century. In the 12th, 13th centuries, it was not found on maps. All mentions of the Rome of that period have to refer have to refer the city on the Bosporus. Bosporus. The Bosporus was the ideal central location in most developed region on the planet in those days. Really, we gotta dig on this Bosporus. Man, we got a lot of drop out there, y'all. It was a stone's throw from there to the rich provinces. It was the most convenient place for all for delivering the abundant tribute by water from the conquered territories. And what is more, the place of eternal peace is fairly near. We have in mind the valley of the kings in Egypt. By the way, no one else knew Egypt as such. They called it Mitzrayim, which has been retained up to now in Hebrew. But Egypt was moved around freely according to the chronicles of the Analysts, wherever you, wherever they liked, all the way up to the 16th century, Syria and Palestine were moved around with it at the same time. For example, the Egypt, Syria, and Palestine of the Fourth Crusade occupied the territory of modern Czechos, Czech Republic, Bulgaria, Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, and Russia, that is, of Eastern Europe. This sounds ridiculous to modern people for the analysts of the Middle Ages, however, it was completely normal. So that means that that's really the true drop. And they moved it on purpose. So what was really there? And the real roots. What's really the drop, man? The foundation. What they're calling the Middle Ages, Dark Ages. After all, they were not able to know what their descendants would later call the Eastern European countries. The dual-headed eagle, which is looking to the west and to the east, became the main symbol of imperial power. The eagle has been regarded as a symbol of power since the most ancient of times. It was associated with the sun, fire, light, also as a symbol of fertility and masculine strength. So this is their hijack in the opinion of the Swiss Psychoanalyst Carl Gustav Jung, the utmost significance of this symbol is the idea of height. Oh, you can, you know, try to go to the heights, but I'll still bring it down. What does it say in Obadiah? Well, Obadiah says a lot about the eagle. The eagle is encountered practically in all corners of the planet, including the Incan civilization in Civ Central America. Therefore, many researchers suppose that the empire already had reached America then. Not only does a double-headed eagle point to this, but also the fact that Christopher Columbus took with him as a translator a man who knew Hebrew. Why did they bring a Hebrew interpreter to conquer you, so-called Negro? Columbus brought with him a translator, a man who knew Hebrew, Louis Torres. And when the boats of the seafarer approached the shores of Cuba, the translator in particular alighted first on the shore columbus expected that the natives would understand hebrew in cuba he said that's where the grand khan was grand khan israelite king so he brought this hebrew right to cuba after the death of conqueror reformer came to power he is named in different ways in 
the Chronicles, Octavius Augustus, Constantine the Great, Constantine the Fifth, Amenhotep the Fourth, or Akhenaten. Whoa, that's a lot to put together right there. So are we, are we calling Columbus Conqueror? Or Octavian Augustus, Constantine the Great, Constantine the Fifth, Amenhotep the the uh, the uh, the fourth. I cannot. <laughs> if conqueror mainly captured lands and collected tribute, then reformer was supposed to govern a huge empire in relatively peaceful conditions. This turned out to be somewhat more difficult than fighting the emerging single state system found itself obliged to cope with the most profound disparity, disparities in the religious and linguistic spheres, local religious cults, and the diversity of languages in the absence of a single written system proved to be the centrifugal, centrifugal force which threatened to tear the empire apart. Modern man mainly identifies himself according to his roots, by which are met besides the rest languages, customs, ceremonies, rituals, including religious ones. In the times about which we are speaking, religion was the main identifying feature. As a result, people in different places were praying to their own gods, but not to the god of the mother country. For this reason, they did not consider themselves as unified population of the new megastate. It is not necessary to elaborate on this political distemper Raged throughout the empire, local beliefs generated a growing separatism, effectively demonstrating that continuity of authority in the capital had not been secured ideologically. Wow, all right, all right. Let me just get down right quick, right quick. You get all this, man. The detail is tracked in the biographies of Akhenaten, Constantine the Great, Constantine V, and is also reflected in the biography of Moses. From all appearances, reformer spoke Hebrew or its cousin Aramaic from childhood. In one of the sources, it says that Akhenaten was the second son of Am Amenhotep III and Queen Tai, an Israelitess. There are grounds to suppose that Reformer was introduced to the idea of a single God by his mother, an idea already articulated and developed by priests in the East. It is clear that this idea did not overthrow the other gods finally and irrevocably. The Judaic monotheism, even in a matter complete form, preserves traces of links with its predecessors. For example, it says in the Torah, Who is like thee, O Lord, among the gods? Only Afterwards, did the Lord become as he is portrayed today? His basic features are asserted in Psalms and the Book of the Prophets. We find the Egyptian trail both in the Apocrypha and the legends of the Middle Ages. In some of them, it is asserted that before he became a prophet of Israel, Moses was an Egyptian priest. The transition to a belief to a one God resolved a mass of problems. It represented not only quantitative changes, one did instead of many, but also quant qualitative. One God is common in all manifestations, and to him, in particular, the only one was the emperor faithful. The only one was the emperor faithful. A conclusion followed from this one most important for reformer. If God is one, then also the emperor and the empire answer to him alone. This is expressed more succinctly succinctly in the formula one god one empire emperor one empire there were not supposed to be any deviations from this the oversimplification of religion was colossal a unique narrowing of the quantity of characters and oversimplification of religious life at the same time the new religion delivered a most powerful blow to local beliefs for by forbidding the veneration of idols, the single God is invisible. This is one of the main qualities. But if so, then there can be no visible images of him. 
The third commandment of the Torah says about this, you shall not make yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or is in the water underneath the earth. Therefore, anyone who worships idols is a pagan and subject to punishment, an extremely easy and effective method of discovering descent. Only one has to find who has an idol or a fetish, and one can use on the free thinker all means of influence all the way up to execution. There is direct evidence of the crime. The prohibition against images was reflected in the process of the creation of the zodiac, which, which was extremely popular in those times in general. They stopped drawing them over a rather extended period. Here are the datings of the Egyptian zodiacs, which were made by the mathematician Anatoly Fomenko and V. Kravish Sevich in 2001 and 2002. Yeah, here's, the, here's the dates that these, you know, cats is matching up. And if you into this stuff, you know, you can look at some dates, man. And surf the wave on, surf the wave on a little bit. You know what I mean? And you keep surfing the wave to the rest of that, you know. But he's talking Byzantine, 1453. You know, chew the meat, spit out the bones, man. We're just trying to see what it is. And again, man, we got this Maccabean... And Osmanian era, we got this Maccabees chronology. Start digging on, I'm gonna leave the link again for you. You know, it's interesting stuff, man. Dealing with this, these different timelines and these uh, different eras before they were switched around. The Maccabean calendars. Yeah, what are they talking about? You know what I mean? So, I'll still leave that for you. And uh, yeah, we, we got a little bit on the AD, this uh, this great schism. I either want to dig some more on this or yeah, actually I want to dig on that, man. So I'm going to drop this again for you, the Sabbath and the great schism of AD 1054. And remember, they said that uh, 1053 is when the astronomical events lined up with this messianic situation. It's messenger. So now you got this 1054 schism. And Pope Leo is all in the mix of this. Pope Leo the IX wrote a long letter of 41 chapters. And the latter part, 1053, that's when this Messiah, Messiah, Christ situation that they're getting it from to Patriarch Michael Cerularis and Archbishop Leo of Akrita, in which he argued that. He was the successor of the Apostle Peter. He was invested with supreme authority over the universal church. And that his word was law for the faithful to obey. He did not present any other defense for his acts. And this is when they're coming in saying, my word is law. Moreover, he declared that the Roman clergy had no authority from either, either, from either the scriptures or or apostolic tradition for making the Sabbath the fast day. So maybe they were fasting on the Sabbath, and then, you know, it's not a fast day. His treaty circulated far and wide and had the approval of the Patriarch of Constantinople. You know, I'm just surfing away from it, you know, surfing away, man. But definitely something, you know, to look into, man, to match up what was popping right around this time period. And it seemed like something happened that's being covered up that was very significant to piecing it all back together again. Let's just get this part right quick. And then we'll move on to the dismount. This is, however, you Greeks, if you do not Judaize, tell us why you have something in common with the Jews and a similar observance of the Sabbath. They certainly observe the Sabbath, and you observe. They dine and always break the fast on the Sabbath. In their 40-day period, they break the fast every Sabbath except, except one and you. And you know, it says in 
parentheses Greek, so whatever that means, in your 40 day period, break the fast every Sabbath, except one day the Jews have a twofold reason for observing the Sabbath, obviously by reason of the precept of Moses and because the, the disciples were saddened and heavy of the heart on this Sabbath day on account of the death of the Lord, whom they did not believe to be about to be resurrected. All right, so now they're breaking in the Christus. Now listen up, listen up. Wherefore, because you observed the Sabbath with the Jews, and with us the Sunday, the Lord's Day. So you got the Sabbath, then you got the Lord's Day, the Baal Day, the Sun, the Sun, the Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sun, worship of the Sun. So it goes from the Shabbat to the Sun. You appear by such observance to imitate the sect of Nazarenes who in this manner accept Christianity and that might not give up they might accept Christianity that they might not give up Judaism so you see <laughs> this was the you know the strategic breakdown of just breaking away your laws breaking away your energy and you already got the connection and this is again Love to my sister, love to my sister for dropping this on us. Hope we can get it a little bigger here. And we'll get this for the dispound. Now let's go from right here. Now this is the uh the thorough good, thorough good drop, Jews in America. The probability that you Indian Negroes are Israelites. All right? Now, by you, it's the following track communicated to the world. I wish and pray that the design, the design be spoken in it, may be cordially furthered by you and all that read and hear. Here thereof, here thereof, tis like you will find in the probabilities so many Judaical resemblances in America. This is written in the 1600s by people. That as it was said of old, either Plato writes, as it was said of old, either Plato writes like Philo the Jew or you. See, there's no J right here, but they put J later. Love to Paco, who said, look, man, that whole J might be, it's such a hijack that they might be hiding the whole creator's name and just putting a sign or a symbol instead of Hawa, Aya, instead of putting the creator's name, the frequency, they just put a J, you know, on certain, certain elements. So it's an interesting way to serve, Love to Paco. Now, Plato writes like, so this ain't man, either Plato writes like Philo the Jew, <laughs> or Philo is become Plato Nik, Nik, Nietzsche, Nike. So the Jews did Indianize, or the Indians do Judaize. So the same, either these Israelites are Indianized, or these Jews that we know are Indianized, like they got an Indian rap root, an Indian core, they're getting their core from these Indians, or these Indians, you know what I'm saying, were converted to some type of Judaism at some point, but when they get the drop, and their Paleo-Hebrew commandments in stone, and Columbus coming with his Hebrew interpreter, they said, nah, man, these Israelites, are Indianized. This Indianization is the foundational root of what they are. This Hebrew is who they are. For surely they are alike in many, very many remarkable particulars. And if they be Jews, they must not for that be neglected. So he's arguing on the behalf of the neglect and the 
torment that's popping off over here. He says, why are these people being, you know, crucified as a people you were crucified? You were crucified as a people. We were crucified. Let's get it. Now, why are these docs so hard to get? Why do they cost thousands of dollars? Listen up. So either the Jews got, did it Indianize or the Indians do Judaize, for surely they are alike in many, very many remarkable particulars. And if they be Jews, they must not. For that be neglected. Visible comments indeed. They are of the dismal text. Listen. He's breaking you down to the scripture. They are of the scripture. Dismal. Thou. Hath become an astonishment. A proverb. And a byword to all nations. Deuteronomy 28, 37. And so they are everywhere to this day. What more reproach, obligé, 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 is there among men? What more reproachful, oblique, or obligé, oblique, or, you know, reproach, man. What more reproach is there among men, let's stop being fast, than this? They art a Jew, oh, the bitter fruits of disobedience. And tis high time for us Gentiles to lay up that example in the midst of our hearts. Remember always because unbelief they were broken off. And if God spared not the natural branches. This is talking about you so-called Negro. This is what they're saying. This is what they're reasoning. This is what's written that they're getting. Say, man, God didn't. Most I didn't spare the natural branches. Take heed, lest he spare not thee. Even in their hijack, even in their Romans 11. It's very interesting. Go read Romans again. <laughs> and see what this Josephus Flavius Paul guy is really getting down, getting down on. So he's saying, man, remember always because of unbelief. And this is what the other tribes are waking up around us realizing their part in this process and they're like because of unbelief they were broken off because they decided to put another power before their power at some point in time but and if god if the creator spared not the natural branches these israelites these negro take heed lest he spare not thee if this is what he gonna do if this is what he did if this is how he judged his own children what is he going to do to us? And that's the city, you know, that's, that's they problem. That's, that's y'all problem. <laughs> We're just waking up. Don't come over here with the guilt. <laughs> come over here to build, come over here, man, to, you know, choose up, you know what I mean? But, you know, get out of our way. Cause we just waking up. We go, we going to wake up. All right. This is another great doc lost. Uh, Israel found the one that we got, uh, you know, about the Anglo-Saxons and, all that drive from, you know, get get part one. This is Joshua pushing the people to the ends of the earth. Deuteronomy 33, 17, the first link of his bullock majesty is his and his horns and are the horns of the wild ox. With them, he shall push the peoples, all of them, even to the ends of the earth. All right. So they are the ten thousands of Ephraim. They are the one thousand Manasseh talking about Joseph. Pushing to the ends of the earth. Now this passage is a portion for the blessing which Jacob pronounced concerning Joseph. And the former part of the blessing Jacob says, Joseph, Joseph is a fruitful bow. A fruitful bow by a fountain. His branches run over the wall. Teaching plainly that Joseph was to extend his sway far beyond any others of his brethren. That in all things pertaining to earth he was to have the preeminence. And then he comes to the matter of his conflicts with the peoples of the earth, all of them, and he should push them so as to overcome in all places, even to the ends of the earth. Now, this is found to have fulfilled up to the present time, to the very letter in the Israelites' wanderings throughout Asia. It has been shown that in all conflicts with the nations, they were always triumphant, but the prophets 
But the prophets everywhere indicate Joseph as a leader of the host of Israel. Then when Israel enters Europe, it is still Joseph who is at who is the captain of the Lord's host. Now it's gonna compare it to this Anglo Saxon, all right? Anglo, Angel, Angel, Anglo. We we're getting the titles out the way, we're seeing the drop, we're seeing us everywhere scattered. Here also he is also conqueror, never defeated. And after they have become settled in the Isles of the Sea, these Anglo-Saxons, i.e. Joseph, Isaac. So they're saying these Anglo-Saxons are coming from Isaac, Joseph, spread out on all sides. <laughs> now, here's where it gets funny. Because we see one way of applying this Anglo and how they're applying Anglo with us as a base or a foundational root and this is how they just twist it and do duplicity and brainwash and hijack and sorcery on their people they say that this pushing the people all of them even to the ends of the earth refers to them as anglo-saxons colonizing in america and the islands of the seas so they are Anglo-Saxons because they're colonizing in America and in the islands of the seas. Not Joseph, you know, the migration and, and, and you know, leading the tribes. Yeah, yeah, but we're colonizing America and the islands. I right? so just wanted to show you that. But it's how we dodge the hijack, man. And you got all these dots, man. You got these dots. All right. This is the doc we put up last time. Old world roots. Old world roots of the Cherokee. All right. Today, the most famous group of mestizo Jews in Vienna Prieta in eastern Mexico. Meshi, Meshi. Now it says they look like, I know it's real small. They look like American Indians, but have reconverted openly to Judaism. Unfortunately, they have for the most part received much rejection from the ethnically pure Jews of Mexico. So the hijack, a notable exception was Rabbi Sinir Lear, conservative rabbi who arrived in Mexico City in 1968. So we're talking recent. He performs marriage ceremonies from them once they formally convert to Judaism and helps their sons in the bar mitzvahs. Da, 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 da. He performs conversions and does all this stuff. So, you know. That says, you are Jews, crypto Jews, but now I'm going to open you up. So they're calling these people being reconverted or remembering. They already are tribes. They already know who they are. But now they're reconverting back. <laughs> Let's get a quick word from Paco, man. Love to y'all. Stay up, suit up. Paco. Right here it says Benjamin, right? I'm going to switch that from Benjamin to not, not to Benjamin, but to Ben. Hawa mean. Hawa. Hawa. Ben Hawa mean. In the territory of Ben Hawa mean. In the villages of Hawa Yu Salem. And in the towns of Hawa Yu Da. He's claiming territory over what's his and what's his people's. Flocks will again pass under the hand of the one who counts them, says Hawa. In the days coming, declares Hawa, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Hawa Yudah. Hawa. So the old time covenant that our people had with Abraham is still alive. Hmm. The old time covenant our father had with Jacob is still alive. And more importantly, the old time covenant we had with Adam, he had with Adam is still alive. So my people, you are still alive. Because the feeling he had for Adam, one righteous seed showed it the best, in my opinion. Again, I, I have no ego, so I don't care if I'm wrong. Come on. In my opinion, and it was you, the righteous Negro.
in those days and at that time I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line, mm. Prester John's line. Prester John, we on your but way. Prester John is just a title mm. applied to David's. That's why King Solomon can be called a Prester John. <laughs> or an historian prince. Whoa. Or an old king renowned for wise counsel. Come on. Shout out to my big bro, King Drop, for breaking that down. A oh, wow. 26 part series. <laughs> Come on, man. We back, we back. Proof is in the pudding, man. When the intentions are right, they're just right. That's when the fruits, when they come out, they always come right. Amen. When you sow good seeds, good seeds come back. When you sow righteous seeds, righteous seeds come back. And we have returned, and we have come back. Hawaii.